It's very lovely to be with you today. Uh, very glad to be here. Thank you to all of those involved in it. I always think it's a wonderful name, isn't it? Men United. As a Man United supporter, I'm especially biased. But, uh, so it's great. Great to see some old faces here with the emphasis on old that I haven't seen for many years. And great to meet many of you for the first time. Thank you to Don for organizing this. Uh, I was born uh, at a young age, and um, I was born in a place called Ramsey, near Huntingdon. Moving out a bit further, Peterborough, Cambridge, around that area in East Anglia. And so, but if you hear every now and then a little American twang, please forgive me. I'm still taking elocution lessons, and I have lived for the last 12 years in Orlando, Florida. I call it the Mousedonian call, if any of you know about Mickey. Uh, it was a very interesting thing. I ended up pastoring there for 12 years. Um, when I felt the Lord tell me to go to Orlando, I said, why Orlando? They have Benny Hinn and other ministries there. And the, the, the Sunday I arrived and announced, hi, I'm here, he announced, bye, I'm going. And so I ended up uh, with most of his congregation to pastor. Uh, by default because they came over to the building that, that I'd rented in faith that God had told me to do it and so there's a whole but there's a whole new era for me now in that that I feel very much uh, the Lord's uh, directing me to come back to England and focus on evangelizing Britain as well as the other nations of the world and so I have redirected all of our television budget to TV so if you have Sky you can watch me almost any day of the week on different stations uh, on, among the Christian ones. Now, if you give me your name and address at the end, I will send you a free copy of my new book when it's out, which will be in about a week or so's time, called Six Steps to Healing. It's a journey of discovery, a, the, the, my own personal six-step discovery that God can heal, God does heal, God wants to heal, and, and many other things from the Word of God. So I know that'll be a blessing to you. So I'd like to send that to you as a gift uh, if you give me your name and address and then we can stay in touch. I feel a real, for those of you that are committed Christians, I feel a real burden on my heart for Bath. I believe that Bath is very strategic to God's plan and purpose. Whether you go back to Wesley's visits here or whether you look at the ministries that are based here, the ministries that have come out of here, I do feel in the spirit I see almost like a, and for one of another word, I don't know if we use a different word in England, but like an underground geezer about to explode from here that, that, that's going to bring people from um, other countries of, and other parts of the country to learn from you because there are many different ministries here. So I, I was interested when Don introduced me to different people, he said, this person has this ministry, this person does this. It's very significant. And I, and I think that, that, that Bath is a role model for the rest of Britain and other countries of the world, an inspiration. And, it's, and so that's exciting. So thank you. Good to be with you. And I've been asked this morning just to share a little bit of my personal story, testimony, journey. And um, so it's been an interesting story. As you heard, I've been, I think it's to about 100 countries of the world. In fact, other than some of the little tiny African countries that I've not been to, I think I'm down to 14 countries that I've not been to now and I'm planning to finish them off in the next two years, so uh, that's good, though. Um, I have to be careful, because the Lord told me to go to, to, to take his healing message, his healing power to the whole world, so I, I don't want to finish it too quick, because I don't know what comes after that, you know. <laughs> I always remember when I, we had our summer camp in England, I had Bob Gordon come and speak for me. Do you remember Bob Gordon? And Bob took him out for a chinky, and we're having this Chinese meal, and Bob says, the Lord told me it's a time of transition. And so I called my secretary, he said, and I've canceled everything in my diary. A week later, he went to be with the Lord. He just died. Nobody really knows what happened. He just went. So I called my secretary and said, book it full. <laughs> <laughs> just accept every invite that comes and keep me busy. So <laughs> I, I wasn't raised, and some of you are not religious, you're not, you, you, you may believe in God, but you don't go to a Christian home. And that's where I was. I wasn't raised in a Christian home. I only ever heard Jesus' name mentioned when something went wrong. And uh, 
all the other naughty words were used as expletives. Uh, uh, you know, I thought the F word was a comma because it was so included in sentences. And I, so I, I had no religious background, which is, which is great, really, because uh, I, I didn't carry a lot of religious garbage into it. And all I was interested in as a young person was the music business. I wanted, when I was 10 years of age, my mother took me to see Ingelbert Humperdinck. And I saw all these screaming women throwing their handkerchiefs and their underwear on the stage and screaming at him. And I turned to my mother at 10 years of age and I said, that's the job I want to do. <laughs> and I had a reasonably good voice. And so I started singing and uh, I won the, back in those days, there was no X Factor or anything, but Great Yarmouth was the place where all the talent contests took place. And I won several talent contests down there singing. And uh, eventually down the road, I got a, a recording contract with uh, RCA Records, uh, BMG as it was at the time. And um, so some of you may remember one of the awful singles I did, which was called On the Beach, but we'll forget about that. Um, and uh, that was the one where if anyone saw the, the video on top of the pops running back in those days where halfway through the video, Cliff Richard did a cameo appearance. You see this guy tapping his feet and then he throws his newspaper in the air and joined in singing with me. And so. M the music business was my whole life. That was all I, w all I, I was interested in. And uh, I was working around East Anglia doing a lot of the clubs and things like that. And one night, I was still in my teens, one night um, I came out of the uh, doing a... I'd noticed while I was performing that there was this man with a like, beanie hat just standing there in the corner watching me the whole time. And uh, I, I noticed him several times because he didn't look very as though he was enjoying anything. And at the end, I went outside and he came up to me and he said, I'm going to kill you. Well, which wasn't very nice. I said, why? He said, uh, everybody likes you, nobody likes me, and I'm going to kill you. Well, I didn't know what to do. He was a big guy. And my mother, at that point, had been sitting at home. And again, we weren't Christians or anything, no, led by the Spirit or anything. She just felt uneasy at home and decided... I'm going to go and check he's all right. So she drove up just at this point. So I jumped in her car and she sits there thinking I'm talking to a friend, waiting for him to get in the car. I said, go, go, go. And she looks at me like, well, what about that fellow? I said, he threatened to kill me. She said, we're going to the police like mothers do. I said, no, he's got a brother that's bigger than me. And actually what happened, he ended up stabbing a policeman. And, uh, but it left me with a total fear of death. I'd had all of these years, all I'd thought about was that I would be successful and all of that. That was all that I thought about as a, as a, as a kid, uh, that this was my opportunity. And, and now I was brought face to face with, with that. And so now I would lay there thinking about how one day I would have to have bars at the windows and guard dogs and all kinds of things. I was just so, ter I, I didn't pray much, but my only prayer was don't let me die, don't let my parents die, don't let my grandparents die, don't let the cat die, you know. Amen, you know, that was it. Death was the, the great fear that I had. And um, it became a prison. I ended up sleeping with a knife beside my bed. I managed to get my hands on, 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 on a gun and kept it just because I had this paranoia that someone was trying to get me. And um, one day, this pretty young girl walked up to me and fluttered her eyelashes at me and said, would you come to a meeting? And uh, I said, anywhere. <laughs> what I didn't realize was I was being trapped. I actually thought she liked me. She got me to the meeting. I received Jesus and, and don't know where she went. <laughs> Flashed her eyelashes at some other men. But she got me along to this meeting. And I was so shocked because the speaker wasn't dressed in a dog collar and robes and things. And he was just an ordinary guy. In fact, he sat there. He had a jean jacket, a jeans, jeans, and he sat cross-legged on, on the table. And I'm thinking, this is not very religious, whatever I knew about the subject. But what he talked about was that I could know Jesus personally. It's interesting. Uh, if you've been following the news over the last few weeks since the riots, MPs and everybody is saying that Britain has lost its foundations. It has no more spiritual or moral foundations, and the young people are just going crazy. Well, you tell them that they come from monkeys, and what are they going to behave like? You know, how can you expect anything better? You tell people it's the survival of the fittest, and you're going to fight. 
And so all of the foundations that our nation is building into people trying to keep God out of it uh, is producing that situation that we have today where of aimlessness. And uh, we need a move of God. We need a revival. Amen. I, 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 I was saying to Don, I feel like getting a big gospel tent and putting it on a big field in Bath and let's have a revival, an old time tent revival. You'd probably get a whole lot of new people in who've never been in church but would come to find out what was going on at the circus. And uh, I did that back in the 70s. We had a big gospel tent and then tent evangelism went out, didn't it? But we, I get, it reminds me today of the days of Wesley when he was around and was just a very debaucherous Briton and God moved and brought revival. And those of you who are Christians, will you, you agree with me in prayer, Lord, revive us again, amen. And uh, so, uh, I went along to this meeting and he said I needed to know God personally. And I went home that night and I knew there was something missing in my life. And I was in my bedroom alone and I prayed and I said, Jesus, I'd like to know you like that man knew you. I said, I invite you to come into my life. I read a little booklet, a wonderful little booklet called Journey Into Life. Some of you know that. And I prayed the prayer in that book and gave my life to Jesus. And there was no flash of light or angels floating around the bedroom or anything. Well, I didn't see him anyway. And, uh, but what I had was peace with God. God had forgiven me. And now it all made sense. Life made sense. It was the missing piece in the jigsaw. You see, I, we're not just a body and, and a soul, our soul being our emotions. We're a spirit as well. We were created by God for a relationship with him. And without that, there'll always be something missing. When people go to the clubs and they get drunk and they, you know, they're not just trying to have a good time. They're trying to find something that in the morning isn't there. And people, they hop from relationship to relationship. They go out and party, whatever. But there's an emptiness inside. You know, when people commit suicide, many people say, wow, I didn't even know they were depressed. But people don't know what's going on inside. They don't know how lonely so many people are, how aimless so many people are. But the good news is Jesus is there but he says in the book of Revelation, the last book in the Bible, in chapter uh, 3, he says, uh, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. The door of your life. If you've never opened the door of your life to Jesus Christ, he says, I stand at the door and knock. The door handle's on the inside. Only you can open it. He won't ever force his way into anyone's life. But I want to tell you, if you want life with a plus, and that's what Jesus said. He didn't say, I've come to make you religious. He said, I've come that you might have life. And life with a plus, life in its fullness. I have come that you might have life. And if you will open your heart to him today, he will, take, he will give to you. He's not coming to take from you. He's coming to give to you. He'll add a whole new dimension to your life. Now, I had a Bible. Many years earlier at Christmas, um, I, I was a spoiled little brat. I got everything I wanted. And uh, there was very little that I wanted. And one Christmas, my grandparents said, what do you want for Christmas? And I, I said, I'd like a Bible. I wasn't a religious person, but I, and I had it. And I never opened it. I think I probably thought I was going to get some brownie points in heaven for having the, the least crinkled Bible in the world. You know. Um, <laughs> But I had it, and I kept it beside my bed, more, perhaps more like a good luck charm type thing, but I never opened it. And this night when I asked Jesus to come into my life, I, I, I opened it for the first time. I didn't know where to read it. It just looked like a colossal book, and who knows where to start, you know. And I never was a start a book from the beginning type person. I'm still not, you know. I usually want to read the last chapter first, and then I'll read a bit in the middle, and then if I'm enjoying it, I'll go back to the beginning. Uh, I don't like suspense. Uh, Tell me, Peter, there's something I need to tell you later, and you're going to really frustrate me because I hate waiting for things. And so here, here, here I was, I pick up this book, don't know where to read it, and I just open it up anywhere, and I look down and I read these words, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. This is the Apostle Paul, and I thought, what? Because here I'd been for years, terrified of dying, and now there's this Apostle Paul saying that dying is gain? I thought, how could dying be gain? And then I thought, well, now when I die, I know I'm going to be with Jesus. He's become my friend, so he's not going to desert me now. And, and for the first time in my life, I turned off the light and went to sleep. I had, um, 
I'd been unable to sleep. Most of my, my childhood, I would pretend I was asleep when my mother checked on me. I would lay there at night thinking of after this, uh, a guy had threatened to kill me, which is quite ironic that now I've gone to headhunting tribes. I've been shot at by uh, Muslim fanatics while I've been preaching in Pakistan. I've uh, walked around mountains to reach headhunting tribes that had killed a Japanese man the week before I arrived. I've uh, been kidnapped by communist insurgents in Eastern Europe during the days of communism and all kinds of crazy things that, that, that uh, I've gone around mountainsides uh, in an 18 hour journey with a single track road with no barrier at the side and thousands of foot drop uh, and, and uh, fearless because for me to live is Christ but to die is gain isn't it we hold on to this life we, we think you know uh, do everything we can but death for the believer is not the end it's just like walking through a door into the full presence of God without even a second wasted without even a second between it St. Paul put it this way absent from the body is present with the Lord uh, I think it was uh, one, one preacher I forget who it was that made this statement he said I have never felt sorry for a Christian that died and uh, we feel sorry for the family that are left behind but do you have that assurance Maybe there's somebody here today and you've never given your life to Christ. You've never surrendered him. You've never met him personally. You say, I believe in God, but I don't know him personally. Before you leave here today, and I, I took my watch off. Someone has to, maybe somebody's got a watch with big hands on it so that I don't overdo my time. Um, yeah, thank you. I took my watch. All right, I'm going to put my watch back on. I took it off because it's bling. I love bling. You know what bling is? <laughs> And someone said, but well, I might think it's a big, expensive diamond watch. Well, if you want to buy it, it is. <laughs> but we'll make a special deal. Uh, could you hold that a minute? I'm going to put my bling back on. And then I know. There's very, there's very few places that a man can wear diamonds. Keep on talking. And not that they're real. <laughs> but I'm praying for them every night to be converted. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> So um, I met with the Lord. I read this, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. I used to sleep with my bed in the middle of the room. As I said, I had a knife beside the bed and I got, bought this gun and had it hidden. And uh, for the first time, I turned the light off and went to sleep. And I've never had a problem sleeping since. Many problems getting up and waking up, but never a problem <laughs> sleeping. And uh, I met with the Lord. Well, when I met with him, I thought, this is wonderful. This is the most amazing thing. It didn't make me go all religious and have a big cross on my head or anything like that. I just was, had a relationship with God. And I thought, everybody's going to want this. So I went around trying to convert everybody. And nobody seemed interested. And for the first year, I failed to win anyone to the Lord. And after a year, I thought, I am very bad at this. This is, this, this. and I remember I laid in bed and I said, God, I've tried to win people to Jesus. I'm no good at it. I've tried living this life. I'm no good at it. I, I said, if I were you, I would take me home now. And I was serious. I said, but if you don't, I'll live for you. But I'm going to count to 10. And if I'm still here when I get to 10, I'll serve you. But if I were you, I would take me home now. And so I began counting one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, <laughs> ten. Well, you'll be really shocked to hear this. When I opened my eyes, I was still there. I said, well, you obviously have some reason, but I need something. I don't know what it is, but I need something. Well, I got a call from some friends, and they said, would you like to come and hear this speaker that's coming in to Hemingford Gray? Hemingford Gray was a town um, 10 miles from my home, near St. Ives, where a revival had taken place. The vicar, his name was Don Brown, had got baptized in the Holy Spirit, and uh, Almost everybody in the whole town had got converted. Scientists, all kinds of people had, had received Christ. And 
almost everyone in the whole town, including all of the young people in the school. And um, so they invited me to this service and I went along and I was shocked. Here they were dancing before the Lord and doing all kinds of crazy things in my mind at the time. I, I stood there like, this can't be right. And, uh, you know, um, but I knew they had something. And the preacher at the end, he said, if you want to receive something, I don't even know what he was offering, but uh, he said, come forward. And so I thought, well, I'll go and get it. So I went forward uh, for prayer. And the man who got to pray with me said, have you been baptized in the spirit? And I said, never heard of it. And he said, well, you need it. I said, well, I'll have it then. So he prayed for me that I'd be baptized in the Holy Spirit and uh, told me something about speaking in tongues, which didn't make a lot of sense to me. And as I left, uh, they, the preacher shook hands with me and said, did you speak in tongues? I said, no, I want to read a book on that before I do anything like that. And so they gave me a book called The Holy Spirit in You by Rita and Dennis Bennett. And uh, I got home and said, I can't wait. And God gave me the gift. But uh, within the, the most important thing is this, in Acts chapter uh, 1 and verse 8, Jesus says, you receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you'll be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. And that's what God did. Within three days, I led someone to Jesus. Within three days, they led someone to Jesus. So within six days, I became a granddad, and uh, spiritually. Uh, <clears throat> And then they invited me to another meeting organized by a, a similar group. And so I went along there and as I arrived there, this woman came up to me and gave me one of those, I know everything about you kind of Christian looks, you know. So I stared back at her thinking, weird. And she said, Peter? I thought, how does she know my name? I don't know her. I said, yes. She said, God sent me here to give you a message. I said, were you coming to the meeting tonight? She said, no. She said, uh, I was at home and God spoke to me and said, come and give you a message. She, he, he said, God said, I'll show you who Peter is. Uh, and she said, uh, I, I haven't got a car. I live, uh, I think it was seven or 10 miles away. I can't remember which it was. She said, and, and, and I had to get a taxi to bring me here. Well, that was a long distance to travel. Uh, to give a message to somebody. She said, once I bring the message, I'm, the taxi's waiting, I'm going. And she looks at me and she says, this is what God says, you will take my healing message and my healing power to the world. And then she got in the car and she left. And I thought, weird, strange lady. But I went into the service and the speaker was a man named Edgar Webb. I don't know if any of you ever heard or know of Edgar Webb. He had received the power of the Holy Spirit through the ministry of Catherine Coleman, who he'd known just before she died. And what I didn't know was God had told him he was about to go and to pass on that gift, that anointing. And so he wore, he was a tall, thin man from Malaysia, I believe, and wore a white suit with a red rose on it, always, whenever he spoke. And uh, he walks in and they're singing the hymn, To God Be the Glory, Great Things He Has Done. We, we were singing. It was probably around 200, 250 people there. I was in the middle of the crowd. Didn't look like preacher material in jeans and a t-shirt. And still don't, I suppose. But I, I was standing there just singing along with the crowd. And he walked in and he goes, stop. I didn't think we were singing that bad, but he said, stop. <laughs> and then he pointed at me and said, you boy, come here. I was terrified. I'm like looking to check it is me. I was about the only boy that was there. Anyway, so I, I, I came out the row and I come forward and he lays hands on me and says exactly the same thing. You will take my healing message and my healing power to the world. I fell under the power of the Holy Spirit. I tried to get up. I fell again. I, five times I couldn't stand. The power and presence of God was so powerful. I sat on the chair. He didn't even preach that night. I think he read a poem or something after that and walked off and that was the end of the evening. <laughs> and so there were people who wanted prayer. So this man, he was very big. I usually close my eyes at that point in case I look at the wrong person. He was very big, bigger than any of you. And 
And the reason I'm telling you that is because of what happened. He comes forward and he said, pray for me to receive the Holy Spirit. So I'm looking for the preacher because I don't know how to pray for people. He said, not him, you. You're the one who got the prophecy. So I closed my eyes and I put my hand on his head like the preacher had done to me. And I said, Lord, would you? And as I just said, Lord, would you? He fell and he was so big, he knocked everybody flying. It was like an avalanche. And everybody turns around and here I am finishing my prayer. And that's how God threw me out into ministry. People came up and said, would you come and speak to our youth group? Would you come and preach in our church? That is how God threw me out. I remember the first church I preached in. I prepared three sermons because I thought they might invite me back again. In 10 minutes, I'd preached all three sermons, shared my testimony and had run out of things to say. <laughs> Doesn't happen much these days, but that's how it all started. And so, and the Holy Spirit would fall in an incredible way. I, at that time, it was so intense. I, I even went into the men's toilets and people would fall under the power of the Holy Spirit. I'd walk into a kitchen and say, excuse me. And poof, there. I remember one time I was, the, an Anglican church had asked me to go and speak there. And I went to the church and uh, people were falling under the Spirit as I was walking into the church. One old lady went down. I knelt down beside her and everybody thought I was praying for her, but I was checking her pulse. I thought, it's not going to do any good for my ministry if she's dead, is it? You know, and so, <laughs> and uh, that night, everybody in the Anglican church, everybody there fell under the power of the Holy Spirit. There wasn't a single person standing. And so that's how God threw, threw me out into ministry. And uh, I came out and a preacher said to me this. He said, God will provide. And I can say 35 years later, that God has always provided. I never know where he's gonna do it, I never know where it's gonna come from, but God has always provided. And, and I've hired football stadiums in Brazil alone. I had uh, gospel crusades in 60 football stadiums and uh, God paid for them all. It's been miraculous how he's done it. The preacher said this to me, it sounds a little bit American, but he said, God, will always, God always provides on time, but sometimes he cuts it mighty fine, is what he said. <laughs> and. Uh, that's been true too and uh, that's what happened I ended up going around the world uh, sharing the Lord the, I remember the first uh, I did the first of my own crusades in Huntington my home area it was supposed to have been Ramsey but the person who was helping me organize it went and advertised it before he booked the building and the Methodist minister wouldn't let us go there then, so it didn't end up the first one in Ramsey. The first one was in Huntington. And uh, the newspaper, the local newspaper, called me to find out what was going to happen. Now, I was excited. I'd read the books of T.L. Osborne about his great crusades around the world. And so when they called me to find out what was going to happen in Huntington, they said, what, what will be happening? And they wanted to put a little report like Mrs. Brown played the organ and Mrs. Smith did the flowers. And I said, the blind are going to see, the deaf are going to hear, the lame are going to walk. Well, they didn't because they didn't come. But I was all stirred up that God was going to work miracles. And a few people came and had a little healings. But I was stirred up inside. And while I'm there, a missionary called me. He said, I've got to go back to Tanzania and Africa. I've been a missionary there. He'd had a nervous problem and he'd got to go back and he wanted somebody to accompany him. And he said, if you come, I'll organize a crusade for you there. I thought, well, God, God said he was going to send me to the ends of the earth, so I'll go. So I went to Tanzania and he organized this crusade and they'd got the speakers set up, the loudspeakers, and they'd got the little bus that we were traveling in behind us. And I start preaching. And as I look, I see all of these Muslims with their Muslim hats on and all of these tribal people in their various clothes. And I felt so out of place. I had my nice little safari suit my mother had bought me. I looked like David Livingstone. And uh, I suddenly thought, why should they believe in me? And I panicked. I thought, why, why should they believe me? And then something rose up inside me that said, because it's true. And I said something very politically incorrect. I said, Muhammad is dead. Buddha is dead, but Jesus is alive. But don't just take my word for it, he's gonna prove it. If there's anyone blind, come forward. And then I thought, what did I just say? <laughs> well, the local blind beggar was walking along and they saw him, he'd got a stick in the dust, walking along. And they grabbed him and they brought him forward. And when they brought him forward, everyone else stopped coming forward. It was like, well, if it doesn't work for him, we won't bother. 
And I prayed for him. And suddenly he started jumping up and down saying, I can see, I can see. And he began to describe the mountains. You see, in these African communities, people are born and live and marry and die, usually in that order. <laughs> and they, they see, we see more people in a day than they see in a lifetime. And so all of his life he'd heard the folklore and stories about these mountains, but he'd never seen them. And now all he can do is describe the mountains that he's seen for the first time. Well, then they brought another lady for it. I remember it as if it was yesterday. She had a cloth over her head to cover her face because she had just white eyes, you know, just the white. And, and she didn't want the dust to get in it. And as I prayed, I saw color come. And she could see. She said she could see. I've always said that. You know, some people say, oh, I don't know about these stories of miracles. I always say, it's not, not what I'm saying. It's what they tell me. I, all I know is the information they give me that they claim. That's why on my side, it always says, they claim that they were healed rather than I'm claiming. I'm not making any claims other than Jesus is alive. Give him a chance. I'm not the healer. I couldn't heal a fly with a headache. <laughs> Jesus is the healer. I just lift him up and he does miracles. And she said, I can see, I can see. And then I said, those that are deaf, come forward. And nobody came. because. And I said, I know you're here. Don't, don't resist the spirit, you know. <laughs> I know you're here. And someone said, they can't hear you. So I said, those that are with someone who's deaf, bring them forward. And then I said, those that are lame, come forward. At the end, and this is the God honest truth, I said at the end, I sent the missionaries in the past, I said, go among the people and see if you can find anyone who has not been healed. And they came back and they said, we cannot find one person who has not been totally and instantly healed. Now today we pray for people and sometimes we get disappointed. Is that the truth? But I have that always in my mind. We're not where we want to be, but we're not where we used to be. And we're not where we're going to be. I remember a time back 35 years ago when if I said, I don't, by the way, I don't look old enough, do I? Yeah, that's what you're supposed to say. He don't look old enough to have been a preacher 35 years. That's it. If you believe I do, then that's a very sad thing. You know, my prayers for my youth to be renewed. And um, so here we have the situation. Uh, all these people get healed and I come out and God then opened the door. If I could tell you the stories, it would take all day and we don't have time. But from there, I preached in across Africa, uh, incredible stories. I remember in Gweru, they bought uh, uh, five deaf and dumb boys and every one of them heard and spoke. The next day the missionary came back to me and he said, it didn't work. I said, what do you mean it didn't work? Well, they heard and spoke last night. He says, I keep asking them questions and they look at me blankly. I said, well, of course they do, they've never heard before. They don't know what you're talking about. They're like babies, you've got to take them and teach them English now so, or teach them whatever the language they spoke was. And, and he said, oh, I never thought about that. And he took them and he contacted us a year later and said that he'd taught them how to speak. And then I felt the Lord say, I want you to go to Asia. And uh, that's where we've had some of, hello? Uh, that's where uh, we've had some of our greatest, is that somebody's cell phone? Or somebody's pacemaker gone wrong? Anyway, so uh, there's a, by the way, if those watching the video can't hear it, there's a, a ringing phone. Either that or Don's trying to tell me my time's up. And uh, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I, then I went off to Asia and um, can somebody get that phone, please? <laughs> tell him I'm busy. Um, the Lord said, I want you to go to Asia. I said, I don't know anyone in Asia. And then someone called me and said, would you like to have dinner with a missionary from Japan? I said, that sounds a good idea. So I went and had dinner with this missionary. He said, would you come to Japan? So I said, yeah, I'll come to Japan. And then from there, they said, well, if you're coming to Japan, come to the Philippines. And then if you're coming to the Philippines, would you come to India? If you're coming to India, would you come to Pakistan? And that's how the whole of Asia opened up for me. And time and time again, he's done the same thing. Uh, I remember in Asia, as, I, as you heard you say, we had... Uh, we've had up to 4 million people in a single service, stretching uh, somewhere between 4 and 6 miles of people. I was with the mayor of Manila the other day and the bishop, the Catholic bishop, and they were saying this is the largest event that has ever been held in the country or in history. We couldn't even use PA system. Everybody had to bring their radios and we broadcast live by radio. 
and, and I go there two or three times a year now, and we never have under a million people each time that, that, that I'm there. Um, and uh, interestingly, it's primarily Catholics and organized by the Catholic Charismatics. And so it, it's exciting what God is doing around the world today. Um, as I said, in Pakistan, I'm preaching, and suddenly four gunmen come running down the aisle shooting at me. They grabbed me and dragged me to the gown. They said, Dr. Gammons, they're shooting at you. I said, I haven't finished speaking yet, you know, and went back again. That was how crazy I used to be. And, uh, but, but because of the healings that were taking place, the first woman to the platform, her son was the chief of police, and God gave her her sight back. And he was so excited. Instead of closing the event down, the newspapers printed a report calling it a jihad, a holy war on sickness and disease. And the, the, the Muslim government gave me 26 armed bodyguards to protect me. So here I am ever I go with these Muslim guards with the, cre the Muslim crescent on it, all are surrounding me to protect me. God has some strange things that he does, doesn't he? And I could tell you stories of how uh, incredible things that God has done and uh, stories of presidents and prime ministers and world leaders. Now almost every country that I go to, the president asks to, to meet me. And last year, this year I was in Ghana and the president asked me to go and anoint him with oil and pray for him. And, and, and it was the day of the he was giving his State of the Nation address and they asked me to do the breakfast show on the television uh, and do the Christian State of the Nation. And uh, uh, then the, the, the Vice President saw it and the former President said, would you come and see me? So uh, incredible things. In, in the Philippines, I've been friends now with four or five of the presidential families. Uh, Imelda Marcos, the richest woman in the world, they say, says that I'm the only person in the world she trusts. And, and uh, incredible things that um, God has done. And all I can say today as I come to a close, and I wish I could tell you more, but we've run out of time. All I can say is, if you've never given your life to Christ, please do it today. He will not, he's not come to take from you. He's come to introduce you to an adventure. Those, of you, those who brought you here, those who are around you and there are many of you here thank you for giving your time this morning because there's some great people here some important people for the kingdom and for the city here today and I appreciate you taking time to be here all I can tell you if you've never received Christ is God has an exciting adventure for you if you will give your life to him 